Hello and welcome to I Care and You webinar 22. Today we are looking at um, an insight into glaucoma. My name is Sylvia Chengo. I am a campaigns and engagement intern at um, Thomas Pocklington Trust. Now we move on to our guest and that is Dr. Harry JRM. Welcome, Harry. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invite today. Um, so my name is um, Harry Jerram. I'm I, I'm in charge of the glaucoma services at Moorfields Eye Hospital in London, um, and I've been asked to come and talk to you about just an overview of glaucoma. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is just talk a little bit about um, you know what glaucoma is, um, what things may arise from the perspective of a patient, and how we treat things, um, and then also. At the end, I'm going to try to sort of answer some very, very common questions that we get asked by our patients. Um, and, and hopefully that will stimulate some discussion. And of course, I will try my best to answer whatever you throw at me in the discussion. So first of all, the question is, what is glaucoma? Um, and it, this is actually quite a difficult question to answer. I was at a conference in London a few years ago where we had probably about 100 glaucoma specialists from all over the world in a room trying to come up with a, a single definition about what the condition was. And we, we struggle to come to a consensus um, ev even amongst ourselves. So it, it is a, 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 a quite a complex entity. But in, in essence, there are several key features. So really, glaucoma is a group of eye conditions that leads to damage to the nerve at the back of the eye. So that's basically the cable that connects the eye to the brain. Um, and when that nerve is damaged, it can cause gradual and irreversible loss to your eyesight, starting at the outside, the outer parts, and then gradually moving into the central vision until the worst case scenario, people lose all sight completely. One of the commonest things, and lots of people will know this, is that it is quite often, but not always, related to very high eye pressure. Um, and at the moment, in terms of how we treat glaucoma as, as doctors, eye pressure is the only risk factor that we are, we know is is treatable and is modifiable so there's lots of research into going on into other other things but right now the, the main focus of all of our treatments is trying to reduce the eye the pressure within the eyeball so essentially what happens in a healthy eye um, so that what I've got a, a picture here is a, a, it's as if it's a cross section through an eyeball. Um, and normally there is a flow of fluid within the eye. So the eye produces fluid in the front of the eye and the eye also filter, filters it away. So when that balance is normal, the eye pressure stays in a normal range. Now, if there is a problem with filtering out the fluid, if you imagine it's a bit like you've got a bath full of water and there's lots of sort of rubbish and, and dirt blocking up the, the plug hole. If that's the case, then the fluid keeps on being produced, but we can't remove it. So as a consequence, the pressure within the eye, because it's, it's like being in a balloon, it's a closed system, goes up. So and then the danger about when you have high pressure within the eye, it essentially applies pressure and squashes the nerve or this cable that as it leaves the eyeball. So if you imagine, um, for those of you that aren't vegetarian, if you're if you're cooking or cutting a chicken breast or something like that, quite often you'll see the the nerve tissue in the in the chicken, which is like so it's sort of quite it's white and quite solid. Um, now. That happens outside of the eye but before the nerve cells get this protective layer they're quite susceptible to damage so all of the the nerve cells as they leave the eye before they form the cable they're very exposed and susceptible to to you know highs and fluctuations in the eye pressure and so it's this increased pressure squashing the nerve fibers that damp causes the damage that then can cause people to lose their sight now, one of, I guess one of the, the frightening things about glaucoma is for the vast majority of people, um, there are no real symptoms. Quite often, the 
outer parts of your vision, so the periphery of your vision, it's very, very subtle and very, very gradual. And because we, we have two eyes, if one eye is affected and the other eye is normal, people really won't notice anything because we normally don't cover one eye to check the other one. We just function with both eyes open. And there's a phrase that quite aptly describes glaucoma, which is the silent thief of sight. Um, and, and I think what this really emphasizes to me is just the importance of regular eye tests so you know we'd always recommend visiting your local optician every one to you know one to two years just for a checkup because a routine check even though it may be just going for glasses the opticians will always check your eye pressure and have a look at the back of the eye as well so just routinely visiting your local optician can can pick up these things before you even realize because that the, for the majority of glaucoma there are no symptoms that people notice another thing is we always are asked who is at risk of de developing glaucoma now anyone is at risk of de uh, developing glaucoma but we know that there are um, certain certain groups of people or certain risk factors that put you at higher risk um Glaucoma is much, much more common as we get older. So if you're over the age of 60, you're much more likely to develop glaucoma. And as, as people are, are living much longer um, and living to an older age, we do know that you know, the incidence and, and number of cases of glaucoma is increasing. We also know that in particular, if you're of African or Caribbean descent, um, there is an increased risk of developing glaucoma. And studies in America um, have shown that Hispanic um, backgrounds are, have additional risk. We also know that if you're um, of Chinese or Asian origin, um, that can also be associated with increased risk. Um, and we think this is linked to the genetics of things. That's why we know that if you have a, a first degree relative, so a parent or a, si a brother or a sister that are that are affected, you 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 will have a higher risk than um, the general population. And lots of my colleagues are doing research into the various genes that may be associated with glaucoma. And at the moment, I think there's over, almost 200 genes that have been discovered. It's not it's not something that has one gene that confers um, the risk, but it's there's lots of factors that come into play. We also know that people with um, either with very thick glasses, be that for short sighted or near sight or far sighted people are also at risk. Um, and there are certain um, medications that are associated with developing glaucoma. So something that's very, very common is the use of steroid medication. So in particular, if people have very bad allergies, we see people that use um, creams that they apply to their eyes um, or eyelids if they have eczema affecting their eyelids um, sometimes even inhale steroid inhalers for people that have quite bad asthma um, and of course steroid eye drops even um, or steroid tablets can lead to high pressure within the eye and, and this phenomenon happens in about a third of the population so it's very very common so if you are taking regular steroid tablets or steroid creams um, I would recommend that you do visit your optician um, periodically for a checkup. In terms of problems with the eye, if you've had injuries or accidents to the eye, that can damage the drainage channels as well. Um, and and that, that can put you at risk. Um, the other th thing that I've put on this list, it says that the, a thin central cornea. So the cornea is the clear window at the front of the eye. Mm -hmm. um, and what we've found um, from lots of studies um, and trials into glaucoma is when the cornea is thinner, you are more, you have a greater risk of developing glaucoma. So that is something that we use when we assess patients to to try to explain to them whether they're at risk um, and in terms of long term planning. Now, I want to talk about what we try to achieve when we um, treat patients with glaucoma. So the first thing to emphasize is that damage to the nerve due to glaucoma, so pressure induced damage at the moment is, is something that's irreversible. We don't have the technology to um, grow back the optic nerve or restore sight that's been lost. So, uh, so my, my main role as a glaucoma doctor is to make sure that my patients can preserve as much vision as they can to maintain a normal normal lifestyle, ideally normal working life and normal family life. So we can't 
reverse what's happened but what we can do is try to prevent any further damage or worsening of of of, of the damage to their sight that they have um, so what we hope to achieve by lowering the pressure in the eye is is to stabilize people's vision essentially um, and it's always a balance about and this applies to all branches of medicine it's a balance about risks and benefits. So we try to sort of give treatments that have low risks and low side, low risk of side effects. Um, and, and that's the balance that we, we have to discuss with our patients. So in terms of treatments, there are really two broad, two broad areas of treatments. In early glaucoma, we normally talk about some very gentle laser treatments or the use of eye drops. Um, and when glaucoma is more advanced and, the, and drops or laser treatment have not been successful, then there are a whole host of different operations and surgical interventions that we can carry out. So one of the commonest treatments at the moment is a is a is a treatment called SLT. So this is a, a laser treatment. And that stands for selective laser trabecular plasty. Um, and what's amazing about this is, and we've shown this in trials that have been performed at Moorfields, is that, it, it, first of all, it doesn't hurt at all. The treatment takes about 10 minutes or so, and it can lead to lowering of the eye pressure for several years without the need for medications. And what the trials have shown is that um, it's 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 effective and 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 prevents the need for for sur surgical interventions for glaucoma, which is always always good. So you know, really, this this was a big trial that one of my colleagues at Moorfields ran, and essentially a, a group of patients half had the laser treatment and half had eye drops as a first initial treatment. Um, and almost three quarters of the patients who had laser treatment didn't need any drops for almost three years. Um, and there were five times fewer any uh, of adverse events with patients that had the laser. So this has been quite groundbreaking because for many, many years, glaucoma patient glaucoma has been synonymous with having to put eye drops in. And, and this is very different now because mo almost all of our newly diagnosed patients will be offered laser treatment as a, as a first line now. So this really shows, um, you know, that this is this was a picture I took of our pharmacy a few years ago, and I, I picked a few things off the off the shelf. And this is the tip of the iceberg. There are so many permutations of eye drops available at the moment that do various things. And I'll, the next slide, I'll try to explain to you how the drops work essentially. So there are two broad principles about how eye drops work um, in terms of lowering the pressure. So I want you to think about it as a, a bath full of water. You've got the tap producing fluid and you've got some you've got, a, you know, a plug hole where the filter is um, that whether the fluid comes or comes out and, and goes down the drains. So the first principle of many eye drops is to turn off the tap. So they work through various mechanisms to reduce the secretion of fluid within the eye. So obviously, if you produce less fluid, then the pressure will come down. The second principle is at the other end, at the plug hole. So if we can cause the drain pipe to be a little bit wider, make the plug hole a little bit bigger, then more fluid filters out. And as a consequence, the eye pressure also goes down. So the, the, the drops and drugs we use to treat glaucoma and lower eye pressure generally work on these two principles. So just in terms of common questions that um, that I, we're often asked, um, you know, what's going to happen to, if you're told that you have glaucoma and you come to, you know, you have to come to a hospital, what's the, um, what actually happens? Now, the way we monitor glaucoma is really by measuring your, testing people's eyesight, measuring their eye pressure. And we do a, a, t a special test called a field test, which is a bit like a Space Invaders game where lights are shown and you have to press the button if you see the lights. Um, and that lets us look for very subtle areas of, uh, of damage to the peripheral vision. And we also, now thanks to technology, can do scans of the optic nerve that are able to detect um, early changes related to glaucoma quite often before they've even affected your eyesight. And these tests can happen any time, any, at any frequency between one and three times per year, depending on, on when you were diagnosed or how severe the glaucoma is. And usually all of these tests are reviewed by myself or one of my team who can then advise on treatment and discuss future future ways forward. And, what, and generally, as a rule, as your condition becomes more stable and better controlled, the frequency of visits tends to reduce. 
Um, and I always say to my patients, the, and I'll talk about this after, but the majority of our patients just need monitoring. So don't need to come into uh, busy clinics with packed waiting rooms. So if you're not seeing a doctor uh, or seeing me at your glaucoma visit, that's always a very good sign. Now, I mentioned it's very difficult to define glaucoma because there are lots and lots of different types of glaucoma um, that are out there. And it covers a broad range of, of conditions. But like I said at the beginning, the, the common sort of end point is damage to the optic nerve, so the cable that connects the eye to the brain, and also damage to the periphery of the vision, so the outer part of the vision. Now, there's lots of reasons why people may have this. Um, the, the most common types of glaucoma are called primary glaucomas, and that, that's a medical term for we, we don't know a specific reason for why it's happened. So this may be, you know, if, if it runs in families or it's spontaneous, we call that primary glaucoma. Now, we can also have secondary glaucomas from lots of other medical problems. So I mentioned earlier steroid tablets and steroid medications. If steroids cause high pressure and people develop glaucoma, then that we call that a secondary glaucoma. And um, if someone's had an injury to the eye, that also is a type of, um, of, of, of secondary glaucoma. But I would say overall, the most common types of glaucoma are primary, i.e. there aren't any other associated medical conditions or eye, eye conditions that are, are causing this. And it's, I think it's important for you to, un, if you do have glaucoma, it's always important to understand for all of us, you know, we, it, the more you understand your condition and your treatment, the more you are likely to, you know, use the treatment and, and make sure you look after your eyes. So always ask your doctor or ask um, your the team who are looking after you about the type of glaucoma you have. Um, the Glaucoma UK website has some very, very good information leaflets about the different subtypes of glaucoma as well that you can access online and download. So that's a really good resource um, for everyone to look at. One of the very sad scenarios is, is when we see very young patients that, that um, develop glaucoma. Um, now, glaucoma, as I said, is more common as we get older, but we, we do have um, children that have glaucoma and sometimes uh, at birth this can be diagnosed um, and but more commonly it occurs with increasing age and there's a graph on the left that just shows as you get older it becomes steeper and steeper so the 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 the, the prevalence of glaucoma increases with with increasing age um, and, and I mentioned earlier about the genetics. So there's over 150 genes that have been um, linked to glaucoma. Um, and that's why we always ask people, <clears throat> do you have a parent or a sibling that are affected? Because it's very likely that you will share genetic material with your close family members. So if they are, they are affected, it does mean that you are at increased risk. A very, very common question we're asked is, will I go blind from glaucoma? Um, and the and the honest answer is is no for the majority of patients. Um, so blindness does occur and we do have patients that lose all sight, but it is very unusual. One of the one of the advantages and, and good things about visiting your local optician, I think we're quite good about this about it in this country although we could be better is that because people go to see their local opticians glaucoma is often picked up um, quite early on and and screening does happen so for example if you have a, a family member that's affected by glaucoma um, your local optician will perform um, screening formal screening for you um, and usually you should have a free eye test you know from age 40 above if you have a, a family history of glaucoma and I mentioned earlier as well, the more that people understand and and know about their condition, the more likely you are to you know use your treatment and and, and make sure you use the drops if you're using them. Um, and I think that goes for all 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 aspects of medicine really. The more you understand why you're having to take a treatment, the more likely you are to to reliably stick to what you've been prescribed. And I always see it as a a relationship where we're working together with our patients so you know we, we try to you know offer the the solutions that we think will preserve vision for our patients but it you know it can be a, you know a stressful relationship especially from when patients are having surgery but it, again it's all about teamwork so you know, it's important that you 
attend your appointments and and really you know ask any questions at all times um and and try to follow the treatment that's being given in order to preserve that your your eyesight in the long term a, a very common question we're asked is about the relationship between um blood pressure um, and eye pressure and people you know people often ask is glaucoma affected by by blood pressure um and the answer for the majority of patients is it's no, it's not, because ironically, if your blood pressure is high, you probably this is probably the only good good part about having higher blood pressure is you get a good blood supply to the to the nerve at the back of the eye. So it's a protective feature in many situations um, when the blood pressure is low. And we see this in some situations, sometimes um people that are more elderly or more frail or, or you know may have quite low blood pressure um and also people that for example people that have some types of you know general surgery their blood pressure is lowered for the surgery and this can in some situations make the glaucoma worse and this this often happens in a condition called normal tension glaucoma so this is a this is a condition where eye pressures um are within the normal range but we still see characteristic damage of the optic nerve and the visual field. So like I said, right at the start, glaucoma is usually associated with high pressure, but not in all cases. Um, and, and we've got to be careful about some drops we use as well, because some of the drops we use, um, they are the same classes of drugs that may be used to reduce blood pressure. So we have to be very careful in patients that we're worried about their blood pressure going too low um, is, to, in, in, is to sort of prevent them having eye drops that might, in theory, get absorbed into their bloodstream and lower their blood pressure, which might cause you know, dips in blood pressure at night time, which is often a risk factor for deterioration of glaucoma. So, it, it, you know, really, we have to be very aware of the side effects of the, of the vast number of eye drops that, that we have. One of the common things that our patients tell us is, and I mentioned, you know, there are no symptoms from glaucoma usually. Um, and most people will say I had no symptoms from glaucoma until my doctor gave me eye drops to use. Um, and, and although many eye drops are well tolerated, we have many patients who, who find them very, very difficult to tolerate and have t you know quite bad allergic reactions. Um, and there can be a rea a re lots of reasons for reactions to eye drops. Sometimes it is the um, it's a, it may be a reaction to the actual dr active drug itself. More commonly, it's to do with what we call preservatives. So preservatives are chemicals that traditionally were used to stabilize the active drug to make sure it stays effective. Um, and what's been quite revolutionary over the past decade or so, or dec decade or more, is the number of preservative free medications that are now available to, for people to use um so that 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 really has helped things so we are able to give um give patients um, um eye drops without preservatives now the other thing we sometimes do is just stop everything and slowly reintroduce drops um to see whether that they can be better tolerated because sometimes if people are on one two or three three eye drops it's difficult to know which one is causing the problem so you need to stop everything and, and try to find out with a bit of detective work as to which one is causing problems. The other thing to say is when people you know, are really struggling to tolerate eye drops, again, this is where the laser treatment may have a role. We use it regularly, like I said, as, an, as a first treatment, but we also can use it to pay, use it for patients who are already diagnosed with glaucoma and when we want to try to reduce the number of eye drops they're using. So, the, you know, the laser treatment is always, always an option. The other thing is cataract is an interesting um, thing as well, because cataract is where you have clouding of the lens. And this will happen to all of us as we get older. Um, and if we do cataract surgery, that actually has an effect on, on lowering the eye pressure in itself. So that's what, one thing that uh, you know, could be looked at in the future. And we also have lots of new um, stents that are available. So when people have cataract surgery, if they're using eye drops, uh, we would normally put in a stent at the same time to help, help make the eye more efficient at filtering fluid away and therefore lower the eye pressure. 
So the the, the pandemic was um, quite a challenging time for everybody who may have needed to come to um, a hospital appointment. And at Moorfields in March 2020, we cancelled about 40,000 glaucoma appointments, you know, in, immediately and had to work out how can we safely see, see patients. Um, and so before the pandemic, the vast majority, so over 80 percent of visits were what we called face to face consultations. And people would spend up to five hours sat in a packed hospital waiting room having various tests. Um, and glaucoma clinics had a well, still do, I think, have a reputation for being very busy, long running and overbooked. But obviously, during, um, you know, during the pandemic, we we weren't able to to do that because it just wasn't safe to bring people into hospitals um, and pack them in waiting rooms. So I remember at the time we wrote this article and we re we, re we were sort of reflected on how we were going to change things. And it really did redefine how we deliver glaucoma care um, across the UK. Um, and the main principles, you know, at that stage were we wanted to make sure our patients and staff were safe. Um, we wanted to minimise how much time patients spend in, in a hospital setting. And we wanted to be try and try and be more efficient with, you know, NHS eye care resources. And I think these three principles still apply, you know, um, at the moment. And I think that this sort of underpins how practice has changed um, over the past few years. So, like I've, I mentioned earlier, you know, if you don't see a doctor, it's a very good sign because it means that your glaucoma is stable. So the majority of our, our patients now are seen in what, what are called diagnostic clinics. So this is where you, you come in and have your tests done and then you go home and then the results are, are reviewed afterwards. Um, so the, I, we drew a little chart um, at the start of the pandemic and the, the bar on the left has about 80 percent in blue, which was patients that were in in person face to face clinics. And then we we were. We literally were planning what may happen, what we were aiming towards. Um, and as it turns out, this is pretty much where we are at the moment. So now about half of our patients are seen in a diagnostic clinic, um, maybe about 40 percent or so are seen in 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 person or face to face clinics. So really, the, the patients we're seeing in a, in a hospital setting are people that need surgery or are, or are about to have surgery or have just had surgery. Um, and everybody else, we can safely monitor efficiently in a in a diagnostic clinic. Now, the nice thing about the diagnostic clinics is um, instead of waiting for sort of four to five hours, you can have all exactly the same tests done. Um, but they take about it takes about 40, 45 minutes. Um, the all the tests that you have done are reviewed by myself or my team. And then if there are any questions that we have or you have, we just pick up the phone and have a phone consultation to discuss any questions or, or queries or concerns. Um, and what this means is that our clinics are not so overbooked. We're not having to cancel appointments like we used to. And people are being seen um, at the appropriate time interval, because before the pandemic, lots of appointments used to get cancelled and people were losing sight as a consequence. So in terms of research, I'm going to talk about what's new on the horizon. Um, so one of the very most exciting things at the moment is new supplements. So um, I talked about how the only current risk factor that we can treat is eye pressure. Um, and there's been a lot of laboratory research su suggesting that vitamin B3 um, called nicotinamide may be useful at stabilizing nerve cells and is a potential, um, you know, is a potential additional treatment in addition to eye pressure lowering to protect op the optic nerve. Um, and uh, and now there literally two weeks ago, there's a, a clinical trial at Moorfields and across the country that has just started for newly diagnosed patients to use this supplement in addition to pressure lowering to see if it has any um, additional benefit. I mentioned the role of cataract surgery and um, an interesting statistic is that is that two thirds of patients diagnosed with glaucoma tend to have cataract need cataract surgery within the first six months or so, so sorry six years or so after diagnosis. We know that cataract surgery reduces the eye pressure. Um, and one question that we've always wondered, and we haven't pursued this, but maybe we should, is is early cataract surgery a, a good idea to you know delay other more invasive treatments for glaucoma? So cataract surgery is, is a really important tool for glaucoma specialists, but perhaps it has a, a, a more formal role um, in, in future management. Now, 
Moorfields is the biggest eye hospital in Europe, and we're very active in terms of research and new trials and opportunities. So um, we we uh, over the last year or so, we we set up a, 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 a sort of website for people to register their interest in taking part in research projects. So this isn't just for glaucoma. This is for any eye condition. So the website is is fairly easy to remember. It's research dot moorfields dot nhs dot uk and you can register your your details on there and it gives you various options um, about for you to specify what disease you're interested in what disease may be affecting you um, what sort of studies you might want to take part in and what that means is that when we're looking for participants for new research studies our team will be able to contact you to see if you're interested or eligible to take part um, so this has been you know this isn't open just to Moorfields patients anyone can anyone across the, the country can can sign up to this for that you know for their for them and also for healthy volunteers as well so if you're if you want to sort of give back to the research field, as it were, um, if your parents or family members are affected by an eye condition, you can register as a as a healthy volunteer to, to take part because we quite often need healthy volunteers um, to to uh, as normal normal healthy controls for research. So just to finish off, um, it's important to note that although you know, glaucoma is a potentially very serious condition if it's left undiagnosed. Once it has been picked up, we can treat glaucoma um, and try to stabilise vision. And because of that, developing blindness, although it can occur in glaucoma, it is very, very rare. And in terms of the monitoring of glaucoma, like I said, it's very different now after the pandemic and the, the majority of people are seen in, in what we call diagnostic clinics just for having their tests. So if you if you don't see a doctor, I think that it, please do take that away as a good sign that your glaucoma is under control. Um, and I think research into glaucoma is a very exciting area. And, you know, this is where we want everyone to try and contribute. And we really want our patients to help shape the direction of treatments and help help direct future research because the reason we're doing this is to help our patients as well so that was really all i wanted to say i've just put this slide up again for our um if you want to do take part in in research at moorfields and the website again is research.moorfields.nhs.uk um, but thank you for your attention and i'm happy to try and um take take some questions now Thank you so much, Dr. Jerome, for an insightful look into um, glaucoma, the thief, the silent thief of eyesight we've just learned today. Um, if you'd like to come on to our next webinar, it will be about navigation apps and how you can travel around the country and um, using buses, trains, um, minicabs, taxis, and how you can use the navigation apps basically to travel around the country and locally as well. Um, this webinar will be on the 16th of April, so do let us know if you'd like to come along. Um, thank you so much for coming along this evening. Um, hope to see you next time.